Very welcome everyone to today's Seedbox seminar here at the Department of Thematics. Uh, I'm very happy to see you all here and I'm also very happy and honored to welcome today's guest and speaker and visiting artist for this month at the Seedbox, uh, Ellie Irons, who just arrived from New York yesterday, two days ago, and will be here for a month with us. Uh, and Ellie is an interdisciplinary artist and teacher based in upstate New York, more specifically in Troy and Brooklyn I think, as well. Uh, and she works with a variety of media and materials and methods in her art, from walks to Wi-Fi to gardening, to quote from her own website. Uh, but a crucial incentive in all of these various approaches uh, is to explore the interconnectivities between human and non-human and other Earth systems. Uh, Ellie's work with the Seedbox this month is part of an ongoing project of hers called Feral and Invasive Pigments that she began in 2013. And this project involves making watercolor paint from the leaves, petals and berries of spontaneous plants growing in urban uh, areas or places or, <laughs> or places otherwise impacted by human activity. Uh, and the visit in Lynn Shopping will supplement three already existing investigations on locations in Brooklyn, uh, in Gothic, Colorado and in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, and the title of Ellie's talk here today is Public Fieldwork in Many Meadows, you can see it up here on the slide, uh, Practicing Eco-Social Art in the So-Called Anthropocene. And what this entails, we will soon hear more about. So very welcome, please, Ellie. Thank you, Jesper, for that um, introduction. And thanks so much for having me here for this month. Um, and thanks for coming out at what I know is a very busy time of the year. I pushed my residency period back as far as I could because I work with plants and I knew that your spring was even slower to arrive than ours was in Troy this year, which was slow. Um, so I wanted to make sure the plants were coming out. It seems like they are. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about art involving weeds, um, which I think I've decided um, from talking to a few people this morning in Swedish are ugras, right? Gras being, yes. yeah, yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think similar to in German, kraut is plant and unkraut is weed. Um, uh, so weeds, urban ecology, and field work. And I'm gonna bring them together through a long running interest in meadows. This is meaning grassy places without trees. Um, and along the way, I'll ask some questions about how this kind of work is equipped or not to approach issues of concern around environmental and ecological justice in the face of environmental crisis. And um, I know probably terminology that I use, some of it might be really specific, so please stop me if it's something that's not broadly used here and let me know, ask me a question, we can kind of go back and forth. I think this talk should be around like 30 minutes, um, but I'll pause and you know we can have a conversation if um, in between, or of course at the end. Um, so, let's get going. Um, yeah, this video shows me making artwork in a disused parking lot that's rewilding, that is turning into a meadow full of plants and animals that specialize in human disturbed ecosystems. And as an interdisciplinary artist, I spend a lot of time in places that look like this. I do have a studio, I'll be using an office <laughs> here um, at the university. Um, and I make paintings and drawings, like you might expect of an artist. But um, for the past five years, I've been using wild-growing urban plants, also known as weeds, to make watercolor paint. And I make paintings about the plants that I harvest from. And more importantly, even for me, I teach others how to do the same thing through walks and workshops. That's the social part of this eco-social art. I use a traditional watercolor recipe, but I've tweaked it to accommodate plants. And projects like these often do end up in gallery or museum settings, like you would also expect. Um, this is an installation showing a range of plant pigments on the left. So those are actually little watercolor wells that I could dip a paintbrush into. And then on the right um, is a map of where in the world one particular species I work with, the pokeweed plant, lives. 
It's a global species now. As you can see, it lives across temperate areas. Um, but it's considered native to the northeastern United States, which is where I'm based. And even though my artwork might end up in a gallery often, my process is dependent on this time spent outside in the landscape. For feral and invasive pigments, it's actually like gathering the materials to make paint. Um, but I'm, whenever I'm out observing, interacting, collecting, and in short, it's, it's really a kind of field work. I have an environmental science background, and I think of the practices I did there in field ecology as very linked to what I do now in my art practice. And when I'm out, I don't just collect leaves and berries and blossoms. I also collect data on the types of plant species I find in these places. Um, so that can turn into these sorts of spreadsheets that end up online, um, on kind of community science forums, that sort of thing. And I've been into meadows and weeds and field work for quite a while. Um, this is me in 1983. And I didn't know at that point that I was standing in a patch of weeds. Um, the meadow behind my childhood home, which was in rural California, was created and maintained by humans and was populated with European annual grasses and other recently arrived species, including me. But it was presented to me, um, and not just by my parents, but by my culture as this miraculous, pristine nature, this perfect meadow behind my house, something I could love, but that I was separate from. And I'll note that right alongside this, there's a whole conversation to be had about histories of colonization in the United States, indigeneity, xenophobia, stolen land, the American obsession with wilderness. Um, and this comes both in regards to plants and to humans as migration proceeds. Um, it's more than I'm going to unpack in this talk, but it's something that I'm thinking about and trying to look at um, in my PhD research. So before I go too much further, I'll give you a, a sense of where I come from geographically. This was like my first meadows were these oak meadows in rural northern California, where I grew up on the west coast. And then, um, yeah, more oak trees than people in places like this. But I went to college in Los Angeles, so big city. Um, and then I moved to New York City after that, and I now split my time between Brooklyn um, and Troy, New York. Troy is a post-industrial town about 150 miles north of New York City, 2.5 hours by train. And that's where I'm working on my PhD in arts practice at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And in both places, I spend a lot of time in these post-industrial landscapes. Mostly these are places that have been impacted by humans and then left alone, at least temporarily, anywhere from like, you know, just six months while they're waiting to build a new building to, you know, a century sometimes where a factory has been abandoned and kind of rewild slowly. So cartographically speaking, and these are these plant hardiness zone maps, do you know about these? Um, kind of love them. Um, it just tells you the average coolest temperature um, that happens in the winter in different zones and it helps gardeners decide, okay, well, you know, however many degrees Celsius cool will kill this plant, so I shouldn't plant it. Um, so I'm familiar with plant species from where that star is in California and then over in New York. Um, California's plants in zone nine, which means the coldest it tends to get is like negative 6.7 to 3.9 degrees Celsius. Um, and then in New York State, I'm working with plants that live in New York City, down in the bottom, and up in Troy near Albany, um, zone 6A versus 7B. So it's a little bit colder there, but even so, I see a lot of the same plants in all three places. These are weedy species. They travel well, and they're super adaptable. And they're actually more interested in living in close association with people than they are concerned with these yearly low temperatures. Um, cities tend to kind of provide a buffer in a lot of ways anyway. Um, and of course, um, these zones are changing because of climate change. So if you can see um, roughly from 1990 to 2006 even, and of course now we're you know, 15 years out from that almost, um, these zones are drifting northward. Um, and I found this interactive guide for Sweden um, that shows that Linköping is around 7B, it looks like, like right on the edge, you can barely see, but um, right on the edge of 7B, which means Annual temps, the coldest are like negative 17 to negative 15. Does that sound plausible? Yeah, something like that. So much colder than um, the zones I'm used to. But even here, I've already found plenty of species. It's clear that your winter is ending maybe a couple weeks 
after because I'm seeing the first spring species that I saw a month ago in New York, two weeks ago in Troy, coming here right now. Um, but the same species, a lot of them. Um, of course, the dandelion. Um, and it seems like, um, yeah, this is a cemetery wall right near where my apartment is. Um, it seems to have a really wide hardiness range. It's growing out of a rock wall, so it's escaped the weed eater. It seems like it's weed whacking season here too. Um, do you have, we call those weed whackers, the things that you, they have a different name here probably, but slapping the weeds, knocking down the weeds. It's like a huge season, in, especially in California where my family is because of wildfires. It's like everyone by May 15th has to cut a bunch of weeds down. They call them weeds, plants. Um, anyway, I think of um, cemeteries like meadows too, right? They're these kind of prescribed open grassy spaces that are kept in place by this human machine grazing. And it seems like you have these giant rabbits too <laughs> that are also doing some grazing. Um, so yeah, I've always been drawn to meadows. Um, this is a place for me where the forest or the city turns into an open grassy clearing um, and new potentials emerge, um, whether for civic activity, um, people demonstrate, picnic, socialize in these open spaces, or for ecological um, mingling. These kind of edge spaces can be really rich. So this is a video piece that compares two meadows, um, the research meadow at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, which is in Gothic, Colorado, and an urban meadow, which is owned by the department of environmental protection in Brooklyn. Uh, one's under warming lamps where they're studying um, the effects of climate change by artificially heating the meadow. Um, and the other is fenced off and full of heavy metals due to this industrial contamination. Um, and here's a, another comparison of two meadows. Um, the decaying parking lot we saw at the beginning, which is turning into a meadow slowly and the browning turf of a, a new lawn in the exurbs um, in the northwestern United States. And they're wildly different, of course, but any of these four landscapes fit into my fieldwork methodology and into my conception of what a meadow is. So whether I'm dealing with this like suburban lawn or with a Superfund site, and Superfund um, in the US is the um, federal program for cleaning up sites that are so contaminated that no one, like municipality or company or something, sometimes they'll hold other entities responsible, but it's a management program for cleaning up toxic, toxic sites, and we've got plenty of them. I tend to work in these sites or on their edges, too. Um, but wherever I am, suburban lawn or super fun site, um, this repeated observation and interaction is really important, so I'm sure my work will change while I'm here. My, what I'm planning to do will probably change in response to what I find here. Um, so in an era of rapid urbanization and certainly biodiversity loss, it's important to understand how these disturbed sites function and what's living there, even if we can categorize a lot of these species as just weeds. They're making really important ecosystem contributions, perhaps most obviously, but still totally miraculously, they're turning sunlight into food, right? This is amazing and it's super important for us and everyone who depends on, on that kind of food production. They also break up impervious surfaces, stabilize and build soil, mitigate the urban heat island effect by cooling our air, reduce stormwater runoff, capture airborne pollutants, and perhaps there's been some recent studies that show that they even can um, aid human mental health through this kind of subliminal exposure to green space. Even if you don't think you're exposed to you know, a perfect park because you've walked by a vacant lot, if it's green, not boarded up, there's some research that shows you still get some of the calming effects. Of course, that depends on how much anxiety you have about the fact that a site like that is derelict or dangerous or full of trash. So it's some of each. Um, and so this is obvious, um, but all of these plants are greening the city without being intentionally placed here or intentionally maintained by humans. Um, they are, as the author of a guidebook to these plants, um, Peter Deltrogici says, um, spontaneous urban plants, also known as weeds. I tend to use the word weed just as a way of like taking it back from its um, negative associations and kind of reclaiming it, um, but I'll use spontaneous urban plants sometimes as well. Um, they're experts at dwelling alongside us in dense urban environments. 
And cities are really important places to look at how plants and ecosystems function because here um, plants are in a way living in a version of the future because urban areas tend to be warmer, more polluted, more fragmented than nearby rural areas. So one of the rushes to urban ecology is actually to look at how plants are adapting to climate change to say, hey, it's already 10 degrees warmer here. What plants are able to survive and how are they acting? Um, and so that's part of why I'm interested in doing field work in these landscapes. And these images I've been showing are all from a project called Feral Landscape Typologies, which is just one of my ways of documenting and archiving these shifting plant communities and their habitats over time. The images here are all from Bushwick, Brooklyn. I lived there for about 10 years, 2005 to 2015. And many of these sites that I was interacting with then are totally gone. You know, this process, if you can see, it's like a meadow on the left has turned into a condo on the right over a period of, you know, six months or whatever. Um, so Bushwick's been undergoing this rapid gentrification process, and at least in New York City still, this results in a reduction in green space, um, and certainly a reduction in the less planned, more spontaneous green space, which I think it has its own value separate from manicured parks. So I use a camera and kind of field work practices to document what was and what's coming next. And part of my idea with this is public field work. Spending time in a street verge with a camera and collection tools is um, not only a practical means of getting art materials, but it's also this public statement. It's like a performative gesture that says ecology happens everywhere. Right? Human influence and responsibility doesn't stop at city limits or national borders. And I'm demonstrating care for um, something that's often overlooked by interacting. And then often my field work ends up you know, turning into some kind of physical object that's more readily recognizable as art. These are my feral pigment um, transects. Um, and as Jesper mentioned, I've kind of thoroughly investigated three sites, a um, place in Brooklyn, um, Colorado, and Taipei. And I'm hoping to do one here um, while I'm here. And they represent kind of a, a method of surveying the local plant population. I choose a location, mine it for color, and then I just improvise a simplified abstraction based on memory in terms of the kinds of plants that we're interacting with each other uh, once I'm back in the studio. I also do, and I might do this here, depending on if I get intrigued, <laughs> um, these comparative color wheels. I've been hunting plants long enough that my eyes tend to alight on bits of color in the landscape. Um, turns out trash is brightly colored and distributed in the landscape in small bits. So when I find that, I collect it as well. And then I make these comparative palettes. Um, a piece like this is like a record of the ephemeral cyclical color of plant blossoms. It comes back each year. And the deteriorating long-term color provided by plastic in the landscape. So in terms of these kind of finished products, I find it satisfying to hang a photo collage or a series of paintings on a gallery wall and be able to represent this deep engagement with, say, in this case, two very different meadows. Um, but also, perhaps more importantly, each piece represents not only my engagement, but others' engagement as well with these landscapes because the collection process involves this social interaction. Whether I'm in the field with a restoration ecologist um, or gathering weeds with second graders. This is a workshop in Taipei a couple summers ago. So now as a PhD student in arts practice, I'm trying to take this work further to investigate how what I'm calling eco-social art can function to build solidarity across disciplines and across species as we navigate this new reality or ongoing reality of ecological crisis and strive for environmental justice in the future. Um, and one thing that comes up a lot in my research, and a probably fairly familiar idea in an environmental humanities focused um, department, is this interest in multi-species livability. Um, often um, this kind of multi-species orientation is associated with decentering the human, moving away from um, a hierarchical vision with humanity at the top. And you'll probably notice that I often refer to plants and other non-human life forms as collaborators or as co-producers in the work. And often I get, not often, but sometimes I get the question about um, you know, what the 
result is of being pro-plant, of attempting to recognize this vegetal agency and decentering the human. Um, does your vision of environmental justice actually include equity for humans? And yes, certainly. Um, this does not mean in any sense being anti-human. Um, artist and writer Patricia Reed's most, um, or somewhat recent article, it's from last year sometime in EFLUX, um, which is quoted here, I think frames this nicely. She references Donna Haraway's recent Staying with the Trouble, um, making kin in the Thulacine, and reminds us that decentering the human um, does not equal dehumanization. Rather, it can simply enable something other. And there's a ton here and in the whole article. Um, but one thing that resonates for me is that it's not an either or. It's the kind of a vision of abundance rather than scarcity. Um, so striving for multi-species solidarity, taking into account the needs and desires of plants and animals, or even rivers and mountains, doesn't preclude us from being for equity or a better life for all humans. Um, so for me, this takes environmentalism, at least as I understand it in the United States context or the American context, and takes it straight to environmental justice, which is something that we're, I think, in activist circles in the United States in terms of environmentalism and equity really working to kind of bridge those gaps right now. Um, and I think the skills needed to do this kind of work, to pay this kind of careful attention to types of difference, whether among humans or across species, um, has to be cultivated. Um, and eco-social art practice, the way I'm doing it, I think is just one method that's well suited to this task. Um, so part of my current research is trying to figure out what works best when you're doing this. And not that um, I want to find a prescriptive solution, but maybe some best practices for certain situations. Um, so one of the places I'm actively experimenting with these ideas is through collaborative work. In January 2017, um, so post our 2016 disastrous election in the United States, I helped found an artist collective called the Environmental Performance Agency. We came together from a range of backgrounds. Um, we have design, choreography, environmental engineering, um, some other people working in social practice. And we named ourselves in response to the proposed defunding of our federal agency that oversees environmental protection, um, which is called the Environmental Protection Agency. Their acronym is also EPA. So we're EPA, but we're the Environmental Performance Agency. Um, and this is us demonstrating in front of the US EPA in June. Um, we were trying to nominate our weedy collaborator, Mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris, <laughs> to the EPA Science Advisory Board. A little more context, the EPA was um, under pressure um, from the new administration actually getting rid of scientists on their board um, and putting industry into the board for environmental protection. And um, one of our things with our collective is like, Let's not just like try to make the EPA what it used to be before it was gutted. Let's like rethink it entirely as a multi-species organization. So it's playful, but also dead serious to say like if we put Mugwort on the board, it would act obviously totally different than Scott Pruitt or now the, his follow-up. Um, even a weed would do a better job, but we actually believe Mugwort's really smart. Um, <laughs> so as we say on our website, um, Appropriating the acronym EPA, the collective's primary goal is shifting thinking around the terms environment, performance, and agency. We use artistic, social, and embodied or kinesthetic practices to advocate for the agency of all performers co-creating our environment. And we do that specifically through the lens of spontaneous urban plants, be they native or migrant. So we use dance and movement, but we also use, say, like soil testing and plant identification in our work. And I'm not diving into the Anthropocene so much here or kind of critiques around it, but you'll notice you know, we have a project called the Emergent Plantocene, which is kind of like rethinking another version of the Anthropocene um, from a plant perspective. Um, for our first year, we had our urban weeds garden in Crown Heights, which is an industrial but very rapidly gentrifying part of Brooklyn. Um, it was on the site of a former auto body lot. Um, which has slowly been rewilding from this really contaminated, um, oil-soaked landscape with a little bit of assistance from, you kind of see her there, Andrea Henke, who's one of our collaborators. Um, she's had the space or had the space for about five years and took it basically from being asphalt to being this kind of wild, weedy garden. And then we moved in and used as our field work headquarters. Um, we've since been kicked out because it's gentrified so far that we can't even stay there. And it, the whole thing has been... Um, 
covered in asphalt and steamrolled again back to ground zero. Um, but while we had the space, we spent a lot of time out in the neighborhood around there doing field work. Um, we did plant surveys and border crossings. This activity we call radical care sitting, um, soil liberation, busting up the asphalt, um, burying rats when it was necessary um, to um, one of our more recent things off the site is embodied scientist parkour, which we just ran with the Penn program in environmental humanities in Philadelphia, which is what kept me in the States until <laughs> just two days ago. Um, we finished that up. I've learned a ton from working with this group because I do come from a primarily visual art background and from environmental science. Um, so they've kind of brought me into thinking about how movement and choreography and these kind of multi-sensory ways of knowing can expand this visual art practice. Yeah, so we have other projects um, besides the field work. This is a kind of more um, advocacy direct um, project called On Behalf of Life. Um, it's a platform that encourages people to submit public comments to our federal agency, the US EPA, on behalf of another life form. Um, there's this public commenting process that's actually pretty important, depending on who you ask, um, for swaying public policy in the US. Um, but it's a pretty kind of dry, boring form that you type in, and it often only gets accessed by people um, who are very strongly on either side. So we were trying to kind of enliven that process by asking people to think from a multi-species perspective about what Artemisia vulgaris might have to say about air pollution regulations, something like that. Um, and then um, I worked with my partner, who's here but minding the baby a mile from here, <laughs> um, to make a platform where you could comment on our website and would actually send it straight to the EPA's website. So um, kind of streamlining the process. Um, so we've done stuff about the banning of um, neonic pesticides, um, this recent really horrible regulation about strengthening transparency and regulatory science. And we have other things that we're hoping to work on coming up um, around the new um, kind of glyphosate uh, Monsanto Bayer findings um, in terms of herbicide regulations. And then shifting gears a little bit, another collaborative project that I work on is the Next Epoch Seed Library. This also involves a lot of public field work. I work with a um, sculptor um, named Anne Prococo on this and other people who join us here and there to save, share, and um, store the seeds of plants that thrive in the same kinds of landscapes that I'm, I've been talking about so far in these kind of heavily impacted landscapes. So we lead super, um, we lead these seed collecting tours in these contaminated sites um, from parking lots to sidewalks to super fun sites. We share and swap seeds with the public. We do exhibitions, residencies, um, and workshops, and the seed collection is also available by mail. We have a curriculum of, curriculum of materials that we share on our website to invite others to set up like nodes of the project or for classroom teachers to be able to do projects on their own in other locations. And we also think a lot about um, this is one of the things that working with seeds versus plants invites. We think a lot about deep time seed pasts and futures because seeds can lie dormant in the soil for a long time. This is something I've learned since starting the project. Um, some seeds need to germinate immediately, but there's other seeds that are actually specially designed to stay alive but in a dormant state. You know, it can be a decade, a century, but thousands of years even. So in a sense, seeds buried and stored in the right conditions can kind of time travel and sprout when the right conditions occur. So we've um, used that as a way of envisioning possible futures. Um, so our newest project just launched last year. And with that, we're exploring the soil seed bank. Again, the seeds that remain dormant in the soil. Um, but this is a focus instead of on um, kind of what you might traditionally think of as a disturbed landscape instead on lawns, a different kind of disturbed landscape. And this came about because I'm back at an academic institution um, and Troy has a lot more lawn than anywhere in, in Brooklyn. So I started thinking, like, what, what is this landscape offering? Um, so we started this in Troy last season and we're expanding it to a few other universities where lawns are very prevalent, heavily managed lawns. Um, so the project involves redisturbing. I think of it as 
something that's already disturbed that we're redisturbing, a one by one meter plot of lawn. We remove the turf to see what plants come up in the disturbed soil. And this could be anything from like a dandelion seed that drifted there last year to maybe a rare plant that got interred 100 years ago, by chance, maybe. Um, so in dense forests, certain seeds will like wait for a tree to fall down, right? That's a disturbance. Um, and then they sprout in that sun-filled gap where there's loose soil. And they're like designed to do that. They need a lot of light. And they're kind of like a um, pioneer species that responds that way. So we're kind of like trees in the forest for this project. But we're humans with rakes and trowels. And we disrupt lawn. Um, so last year, we had 10 plots. Um, and we did a lot of them as public workshops. I'd invite folks to join me for a redisturbance workshop. And we'd read a lawn redisturbance acknowledgment together, observe the lawn ecology that we actually are disrupting an ecosystem, however depauperate. And then we pull off the turf. It's really satisfying to rip up lawn. Uh, little kids especially really love it. Adults too, though. Um, and in the end, you end up with a kind of minimalist sculpture. It's like this blank earthen square. But it gradually rewilds itself over the course of the summer in response to intervention. Um, so above is the day of the disturbance, and below is 15 or so, or maybe a little farther. No, about a month in. Um, that's like 15 species coming up where there was one or two before. So I catalog the species that show up, and I upload them to iNaturalist, which is a community science um, platform that has a lot of scientists using it, actually. So we get good IDs, and the data becomes shareable. So one thing that's come across in this project is that um, not all lawns are created equal at all. You have beautiful dandelion-filled lawns here with actually quite a bit of biodiversity in them, I've noticed from walking back and forth a couple times. At RPI, where I'm in, um, going to school right now, um, there's a lawn care firm called True Green. True Green. <laughs> um, and they banish everything that's not grass down to the last dandelion rosette. Like the college president actually has this corridor down the middle of the college where there cannot be any dots of yellow on graduation day. So that means herbicide, um, and pretty often. Um, and they mow, fertilize, of course. And they create this kind of perfect monoculture. And then in North Troy, where I work with a local nonprofit on um, art, science, and environmental justice um, initiatives, and also have some plots. They're kind of dealing with a whole different side of lawns. Their lawns tend to be really ecologically diverse. Um, they're often just mowed. And usually they're mowed just in response to Troy's weed regulations, which is that um, six inches, about like that. Your weeds can't be taller than that. Or someone can report you to the city and you get fined. Um, and in practice, the city doesn't have enough money to actually go around and make sure the weeds aren't that tall. But if you have an enemy, like my old landlord, who kicked me out of my house for keeping my weeds, I mean, it's serious. Like, she got really, really mad about it. Um, and I was stubborn. Um, yeah. So th this is another fascinating issue, that the, the language around yeah, nuisances and injurious public health, et cetera. Um, anyway, so there's two different, very different kinds of lawns in Troy. Um, and they're not just like physically different. They have different social and cultural meanings. Um, and the, they represent the places they're embedded in. So the plots at my university, at RPI, down here, um, are sited in a powerful place that's literally on a hill, like way up above town. It has tons of resources and tons of poisons to pour onto the landscape to maintain it. And then in North Troy, it's uh, one of the poorest census tracts in the area. It's inhabited mostly by people of color. And they live in the mess left behind by the Industrial Revolution, which includes a local Superfund site. We can't swim in the Hudson River or eat fish out of it because of PCB contamination. And the soils are full of heavy metals. So you have to have them tested before you grow anything in them, um, usually make raised beds. Um, so you know, one of the questions with this project is what do these lawns have in common? Um, and what do we need to pick apart as we look at them, as we interact with them, and with the people and plants who live alongside them? And in doing this kind of work, I'm interested in and also wary about how this project generates data um, about the kinds of plants that might rewild a site after a disturbance, and potentially about soil quality and toxicity. I haven't gotten to that point yet, but um, you know, the pilot project last year is turning into some of my dissertation research. So in 2020, I'd like to do um, soil quality and toxicity testing, which would also then become publicly available information. 
It's not big data. <laughs> um, an ecologist friend of mine who's advising me on it calls it small artisanal data. Um, I want to learn more about how independent community-based science can generate knowledge and information that can be reinvested into the community that made it rather than just being extracted and like passed up the line. And how art can make these processes more accessible and transparent to community partners and um, others who might not ordinarily be brought into the conversation. In the case of the Lawn Redisturbance Lab, folks can see the experiment out in the world. It's meant to kind of exist as a public sculpture. They can participate in these plant ID days that I run throughout. Um, they can visit and ID test plantings inside at our community nature lab in North Troy. Um, the project also has a, like, I take a soil sample from the plot and take it inside so I can kind of run a control and see what seeds were truly in the soil versus like a bird flying over and you know dropping or pooping or whatever, a new seed into the plot. Um, they can follow along online. I do lots of social media with the project. And then again, the, the iNaturalist identification. And do gallery exhibitions as well. And one framework I'm drawing on to think about this is from the scholars um, Georgina Bourne and Andrew Berry's concept of the public experiment. Um, they're working on interdisciplinary art science collaboration, and they write about how art science projects can illuminate and expand scientific processes, this idea of connecting the social to the political. And they advance this idea of a public experiment. And I had my public field work before I discovered public experiment, but it makes a lot of sense to me um, as a form of art that can forge um, relations between new knowledge things and persons that did not exist before. So kind of creating new knowledge out of art science rather than one-way translation, which often when I say I work with art and science, um, people will expect that I you know, might illustrate a scientific idea or something like that. So extending that idea a little bit um, to add the performative aspect, this performing ecology field work um, with my collective work, we're hoping doesn't just translate facts into another language, but actually makes knowledge or reframes knowledge so that it can be read politically and socially. And it's something I'm um, still figuring out how to do and you know, actively in the research phase with um, different partners on. And to wrap up, um, I'll just leave us with some final questions. Um, Right now, um, why art? <laughs> why interdisciplinary socially engaged art incorporating ecology to address kind of environmental crisis, ecological justice? Um, I think there's a range of possibilities for why this kind of work is useful now. It's one of many strategies. I think we need all the strategies. Um, I think um, holding contradictions um, when you're approaching concerns around conservation, sustainability, and environmental justice now, I often see the need to hold tensions and seemingly incompatible ideas together in kind of a single moment. Um, and I think that um, art can, in some cases, um, highlight and make those tensions legible. It's good at friction. Um, I'm also investigating. This is um, an idea that I heard artist Tanya Bruguera describe recently at a Creative Time Summit. Art is an opportunity for modeling desired futures. I think plenty of people have had this idea um, as a means to live better in the present moment, not wait for change, but try to create a small pocket of it um, to experiment. Um, skill building, like it's super concrete and basic to know what plants are living on your block and what ones are edible and what might be medicine, um, but also to know, you know where the soil is toxic and where you wouldn't want to plant something. Um, this kind of knowledge sharing between and across disciplines and even across species, if we can learn from other species, has a role to play in navigating the time period we're in. And also, if you're working across disciplines, this idea of um, being an amateur. Um, Claire Pentecost um, has labeled herself a pe public amateur and consented to learn in public, um, which is not always totally comfortable. Um, but maybe you see pitfalls and blind spots that you don't when you're siloed. Um, and then beyond that, um, maybe doing away with the concept that there's only one kind of expert, um, what are other forms of expertise um, as we rework hierarchies of knowledge and bring in a wider range of perspectives, um, be they human or non-human at the Environmental Performance Agency, we insist that the weeds are our mentors and we try really hard to, 
to actually follow that. Like it's, it seems absurd, but what does it mean to try to learn from a plant? Um, so I guess I'll leave you with those questions and wonder if you have any of your own. I have questions for you too, if we have, if we have time. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.